airfields were more concerned with utility than comfort. In the early years, tents were the only amenity set up for the enthusiastic crowds who flocked to watch aviators' daring exploits. During the war, open fields provided a runway and hangars stored equipment and aeroplanes. The first passengers became used to enduring the elements as they walked out to their aeroplane. But as air travel increased in popularity, cities recognized a new opportunity and airports lifted to a new level of comfort. When South London's Croydon Airport expanded in 1928, authorities boasted of every modern convenience, hotels, a post office, and even a bookstore to replace the old wooden huts in an open field. It was the world's first purpose-built terminal building. Croydon was also the first airport in the world to introduce air traffic control and became the main gateway to London during the 1920s. Many famous aviators flew into the airport, among them Charles Lindbergh just after his historic transatlantic flight, Bert Hinkler who flew from Croydon to Darwin, Australia, Charles Kingsford Smith and Amy Johnson who flew from Croydon on her record-breaking flight to Australia. The terminal buildings and aerodrome hotel were built in the Art Deco style and featured cutting-edge design, including an eye-catching time zone tower in the booking hall with dials that depicted the time around the world. In the 1950s, Croydon was replaced by London Airport, later known as Heathrow, and Luton Airport in Bedfordshire. Luton was launched in 1938 and served as a base for Royal Air Force fighters during the Second World War. When hostilities ended, it was used for charter operations by airlines such as Autair and Euravia, who were running low-cost holiday packages to Europe. Euravia later changed its name to Britannia Airways, then Thomson Fly, and still operates from Luton under the name Thomson Airways, one of the world's largest charter airlines. The concept of combining airfare and accommodation into one package proved to be very appealing to British holidaymakers, and Luton soon became London's most profitable airport. By 1969, a fifth of all holiday flights departing the United Kingdom left from Luton. In the 1940s, Stansted Mount Fitchett Airfield was used by the Royal Air Force and the United States Army Air Force for bombers and maintenance operations. After the war, the airfield temporarily housed German prisoners of war before being taken over by the Ministry of Civil Aviation in 1949. However, it was then transferred back to the military for a few years as there were plans to extend the runway and use it for NATO operations. When this failed to eventuate, the airport went back to civilian use in 1957 and, like Luton, became a hub for holiday charter airlines looking to avoid the high charges of the bigger terminals at Heathrow and Gatwick. Other countries were also looking to the aviation industry to stimulate their economy. In 1958, a new airline terminal equipped for jet age passenger service was being built at the Copenhagen Kastrup Airport in Denmark. The first stage of the huge expansion and rebuilding program involved an extension of the airport's main southwest northeast runway to the jet traffic length of 9,200 feet. This was to be expanded by another 1,650 feet by 1960, and the alternate main runway lengthened to 9,200 feet. Known as the European Gateway of the North, Kastrup handled one million passengers in 1957 and was expected to handle an additional 250,000 by 1960, or 1,600 passengers an hour. The airport's arrival hall was doubled and customs and baggage clearance streamlined. 
the departure and transit halls were also earmarked for expansion. The new House of Glass passenger terminal had dimensions of 525 feet long and 220 feet wide, twice the floor space of the original building. Massive finger gates were designed to reach out slantwise to the tarmac from the terminal building, giving protection for arriving and departing passengers, a necessity in any Scandinavian country. The enlarged airport also included an apron with 25 parking positions allocated according to types of aircraft with the potential to increase the number of aircraft to 35. The airport design also included a 10-story air traffic control tower. Copenhagen Airport still services Denmark, now handling more than 20 million passengers every year. In 2007, the airport was connected to the Copenhagen Metro train system, and the following year, a new control tower was opened as part of a major renovation of the air traffic control system. The airport currently has three terminals, and a fourth is scheduled to be open in 2010. Across the Atlantic, airports have become a vital component in the United States transportation system. The country's vast distances made flying an attractive proposition for businessmen, and towns and cities across America rushed to build airports and aerodromes to encourage industry. American industry and business in the West, in the South, in the East, is the number one user of airplanes and airports. Most municipal airports of the manufacturing centers of New England, the Great Lakes region, and the South are constructed to handle a constant flow of air traffic. Runways are paved, they are long, and there are several of them. They are built for heavy multi-engine aircraft. They are built to handle the executive aircraft of American industry. As industry builds branch factories, as it follows the pattern of decentralization, the smaller cities face an airport problem. There are few large industries today that are not airplane users. Many use both large and small aircraft. The smaller business planes are used by the engineering division, by production, and by the spearheading sales division. As one sales manager said, we use our airplane because it makes us independent. We make our own schedules. We don't have delays en route. We gain from two to three days a week. We figure the cost of a trip by regular public transportation and apply it to our airplane fund. The salesmen with big territories to cover are turning to the airplane. They visit the town with an airport like they used to visit the town on the railroad and then the town on the highway. More and more, they will come to the town with an airport. They may land at Winnipeg, Atlanta, Mexico City. They may land at Oak Ridge, Fairbanks, Flagstaff, or Anaconda. They may land at your town or mine. For the air is the greatest freeway man will ever know. It doesn't have to be built or maintained. It touches every city and town. So little is needed to use it. An airplane, a smooth strip of ground. As business travel grew in scope, so did the facilities aimed at enticing travel-weary corporate jet-setters. Every second of every day, an average of five airplanes are taking off or landing somewhere in these United States. Every day, our airlines fly, on the average, a distance equal to four round trips to the moon. Airport terminals offer the latest in telecommunications, comfortable lounges and cocktail bars. Soon there were showers, shops, dry cleaners and hairdressers.
With more and more airlines flying across the USA and the world, landing slots quickly filled, and the average city airport became a big source of employment. As many as 50,000 passengers pass through a major terminal in a day, most of them with luggage. There are going to be continually more passengers. These passengers are going to fly more miles, and they are going to fly them faster. From Cincinnati to Chicago, Minneapolis to Miami, Americans were embracing the jet age and flying like never before. For the airlines to set up fast schedules and then meet them requires more than the raw speed of the jets. Airports of the 1950s were triumphs of modernist design with huge curved slabs of glass and concrete representing the vision of futuristic travel. And the jets themselves were triumphs of engineering. Families would gather at the airport on a day out simply to watch the giant airplanes take off and land. The whole process of jet travel required an ever more complex administration system. From ticketing to baggage collection, the scope continued to expand. Fortunately, new technology was also expanding. Automation of ticketing and baggage collection helped airlines keep pace with the rise in passenger numbers. How is it possible to coordinate all that is required for a flight? For flight after flight, day after day, and still to include provision for last minute changes? May I help you? I'm booked for 7.30. Is there any chance of getting out earlier? Glad to check for you, Mr. Thompson. Hello. Do we have any space on flight 210 to Los Angeles? Thank you. I can book you on a 3 o'clock departure for Los Angeles, sir. Oh, good. All right, sir. Check your bag. modern air terminal is designed for passenger convenience, with services available that help make air travel an integral part of the life of a nation on the go. The growth in telecommunications was a boon for the aviation industry, enabling last-minute schedule changes and keeping passengers and flight crew in the loop. Many industries benefited from the growth in airline travel, among them taxis, helicopters, and rental car companies. In this fast-moving world we're living in, the telephone is a part of the immediate, direct, and personal communications required in the jet age. And so many kinds of information are transmitted over communication lines. For instance, the weather in Phoenix is clear and the temperature 76 degrees. Most of the communications at an airport are not by passengers, but for passengers by airline personnel. And most of these communications take place behind the scenes. It starts with when you ask about reservations. Your call may be to a centralized reservations office, which serves many cities, where it goes to the first available agent in the order in which it is received. For example, in making a reservation, you could dial a local airline reservations number in Washington, D.C., but telephone equipment would automatically switch your call to the airline's reservation center, such as this one in Charlotte, North Carolina. Here, the agent has immediate access to all required information and can make your reservation immediately. Or you may dial a local number in your city Talk to an agent in a local ticket office, and that agent will check with his airline's reservation center, which may be from a few miles to the length of the continent away. 
Telephones and telephone lines play an important part in making airline reservations. The airlines use high-speed computers to keep a record of future reservations. Your call is probably one of 10,000 to come into a reservation center that day. But the combination of computers and high-speed communications will give you an immediate answer. Another method. If you were to stop into a ticket office for flight information, say to Chicago or New York, or even around the world, the agent would put your request for a reservation into a console, which transmits it over the telephone lines to a centralized office. Within a second, the answer comes back. If you book the flight, the agent puts that data into the console for transmission to the reservation center for relay to the computer. Other reservation agents across the country now have this information available. Need information to schedule And as airline reservation systems became both easier to use and more complex, service on board the airplane was changing just as fast. The earliest scheduled airline flights were a less than pleasant experience. One passenger described the trip from London to Paris thus. They put you in a box, they shut the lid, they splash you all over with oil, you're sick and you're in Paris. Newer airplanes such as the Vickers Vanguard contained more comfortable cabins and stewards were brought on board to serve as flying butlers. Their role was similar to that of a steward on a cruise ship or a train. On the Vanguard, Stewart served food and wine to the 20 passengers and saw to passenger comfort in the cramped surroundings of the cabin. In 1925, a registered nurse called Ellen Church became the first female steward, and by the 1930s, it had become common practice for airlines to employ young, attractive women as air stewardesses or hostesses. Some of our girls have chosen to make a career for themselves as air hostesses reporting for duty at the Amsterdam Drome of the KLM service. One of the first things she does is to make herself familiar with the times of departure and arrival. There are questions she's bound to be asked among hundreds of others. Then there's the matter of the fluctuating exchange. Money talks, but sometimes only in a whisper. In their trim uniforms and hat brims at just the right angle, the girls look as if they really enjoyed their job. Though there's plenty of variety, they have many responsibilities. Final check of the stores and she's all set. So with a smile and a handshake, it's all aboard. But it's in the air that her work really begins. Maybe one of her charges was thinking of a rug and, well, well, here it is. Between bouts of sightseeing, there might be an urge for coffee. And as if by magic, the coffee appears. It's all done by kindness and the percolator. A quietly efficient air hostess knows how to entertain children of all ages. And if they're very young, she'll even play roly-poly. And as if all her other duties weren't enough, she's kept busy pointing out the places of interest on the route. The bright personality and self-assurance of the air hostess is reflected in her guests. And her secret? Well, it's in the air. Most companies set a height limit on stewardesses of about 5 feet 4 inches due to the small cabins. In the early days, they served as tour director, took tickets, loaded luggage, and even helped refuel the airplane and push it into the hangar. But as the aviation industry expanded, crew roles became more specialized. By the early 1940s, refueling was carried out by mechanics, leaving flight attendants to concentrate on in-flight duties. Another spot of oil and last minute fussing and time's up. The chalk timetable shows that intending passengers should now be getting aboard. we're all set for the first stage of our three mile a minute thrust through the clouds and the plane makes a perfect takeoff as the ground sinks below the passengers get a grand view of new york's harbor and the man-made mountains and concrete canyons of manhattan
if window peeping doesn't claim your attention, there are cards. But the stakes needn't be as high as the plane. As the giant ship breasts the clouds of spun silver over the farmlands of Ohio, the clock moves round to lunchtime, and there's more on the menu than air pie. Another long hop and evening falls as the plane approaches Chicago, the metropolis of mid-America. Revolving beacons sprinkle the darkness with pinpoints of light to guide the machine to a perfect landing. Flying by night has become a habit in these transcontinental tours, and it's safe too because of the reliability of modern scientific instruments and two-way radio communication. For the traveler on his or her first flight, an experience worth writing home about is going to bed in a plane. A feather bed may be a luxury, but a kip in the clouds is a positive joy. Not even the gentle scraping of a skyscraper can disturb the soothing lullaby of the plane's engine. Nighty night. Comes our old friend, the dawn with a plane flying three miles up to conform with safety regulations. And now come the spidery cables and tall pylons of the Golden Gate Bridge, the largest suspension bridge in the world. All sense of speed is lost. We seem to be floating lazily above the placid bay. We have spanned America, thanks to the wings of the West. Military aviation overshadowed civil flying during the Second World War, but when the war ended, passenger airlines went full throttle. Pan American World Airways restarted their transatlantic service in November 1945, flying a four-engined Douglas aircraft. Before the war, flying boats were used. This trip is the first American transatlantic passenger flight in a land plane. American airlines have got away to a flying start in the air race to cover the globe. Fifteen hours after leaving New York's LaGuardia Field, the clipper touches down at Hearn Airport, London. At the end of November, fares will be cut from 143 pounds to 68 for a one-way crossing. Sign that US Airways mean business. Captain and stewardess take a look at England. Now one of the government's many pigeons, British Airlines face keen competition. Long-haul airlines were able to reduce ticket prices considerably by eliminating the individual sleeping compartments favored by the flying boats and installing reclining seats, which boosted passenger numbers per flight. A glut of military air bases and flying fields made land-based aeroplanes a more financially viable proposition than flying boats. Air France also resumed flights to England after the war, flying the 33-seater Languedoc 161 airliner to North Airfield in 1946. The four-engined airliner was another replacement for the flying boats that had dominated before the war. Manufactured by Sud-Est, the Languedoc carried a crew of five, including two cabin crew. Unfortunately, the Languedoc had to be withdrawn from service only a few months after its launch because of problems with the engine and landing gear and the difficulties it had operating in wintry conditions. The following year it re-entered service, equipped with new Pratt & Whitney R1830 engines, de-icing equipment and cabin heating. Flight attendants heated food on the aircraft, providing tasty French cuisine to the appreciative passengers, despite the short flying time from London to Paris. The elaborate courses were served on fine china with sterling silver cutlery and the finest damask linens. The early days of flying saw flight attendants subjected to some strange rules. With pilots seen as heroic figures for their role in the war and their involvement in a risky industry, one airline gave the following instructions to its stewardesses. A rigid military salute will be rendered the captain and co-pilot as they go aboard and deplane before the passengers. Check with the pilots regarding their personal luggage and place it on board promptly. Aeroplanes were still seen as a novelty before World War II, and stewardess Inez Keller recalled a time when her plane ran out of gas and landed in a wheat field near Cherokee, Wyoming. People came in wagons and on horseback to see the plane, she said. 
they'd never seen an aircraft before and they wanted to touch it and to touch me. One of them called me the angel from the sky. Another stewardess, Harriet Fry, remembers being invited into the cockpit and sitting on a bag of mail while the pilots hedge hopped at around 500 feet. We would frighten the pigs and the farmers didn't like that, she said. Boeing insured Fry for $5,000 in case of accidental death. On mail planes, cabin crew had the responsibility of checking the cargo manifest as well as maintaining crew comfort on board. Most airlines refused to hire women as pilots, so girls with their sights set on aviation as a career had to settle for stewardess duties. War is over, but the battle of the great airlines is only just beginning. While boys of Great Britain may still long for the romance of the sea, the modern British girl lets her imagination and ambition soar into the skies. The silver wings of the planes draw her like a magnet. When a girl like Elizabeth sets her heart on something, all the notices and fences in the world won't keep her out. The last barrier, an airfield official. Elizabeth skirmishes successfully and is soon on her way to the interview, which means a new and thrilling life for her. Other girls are waiting, but Elizabeth is not afraid of competition. Her mind is made up. She's going to get the job. Good morning, Miss McIntosh. Please sit down. Mm -hmm. I see that you want a position as a star girl. I've been looking through your application form. There are one or two questions I would like to ask you. Firstly, why do you want to become a star girl? Because I'm interested in people and in travel. What languages do you speak? Spanish and French. And your nursing experience? Red Cross First Aid and Home Nursing Certificate. And what about your catering experience? I've taken a course in domestic science. Thank you very much. That'll be all for now. You'll be hearing from us in due course. Will you please ask the next applicant to come in? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. She got the job, and her initiation began with inoculation and a stiff medical. An air hostess must be absolutely fit. Then came the day of days, the very first flight. Was she going to be scared? Were the others scared? If any of them were, there was no trace of it. Hello, Mike, you lucky devil. After the friendly welcome, they began to explore. It was more exciting than looking over a new house. Soon the plane was airborne, and Elizabeth knew finally that this was where she belonged. Six years ago, down there near St Paul's, she'd watched the dogfights over London. Today, her six-year-old ambition to fly is fulfilled. Airlines discovered early on that beautiful, well-dressed cabin attendants gave them prestige and attracted plenty of attention. American and European airlines favored sharp tailoring, knee-length skirts and high heels. The only exceptions were places like Alaska, where the attendants were allowed to wear eiderdown parkas and ski pants when the airplane was grounded due to bad weather. The stewards resembled ocean liner stewards of old in white tuxedo jackets, black bow ties and cummerbunds, and a peak cap. But there was more to many flight attendants than just sharp tailoring, as one BOAC employee showed. Passengers arriving at the Marine Airway Terminal, Southampton, are familiar with the blonde head and trim figure of receptionist Marguerite Wilson. What they don't know is that Marguerite herself is a renowned young lady in certain circles. After working hours, she hurries home on her bicycle. Then she changes and uh, goes out on her bicycle. But this is a different bicycle and a different Marguerite. This is the Marguerite Wilson known to cyclists throughout the world as the holder of 16 world titles. 
Each evening, whenever possible, you'll find Marguerite keeping in shape, and a very shapely shape it is too. With 16 world titles to her credit, and 20 trophies insured for 350 pounds locked away at home, Marguerite's career was interrupted by the war. But it looks as if we'll be hearing more about her shortly, for Marguerite takes her cycling very seriously. And one flight attendant took up a very appropriate extreme sport in her spare time. Hostess Patricia Garner was picked from seven applicants to perform at a charity air display in Denham. She found it a hair-raising experience. Oh, well, it's different. I'll say that from the inside. Yeah. But it was marvellous. It marvellous. really was, yes. Exhilarating. Except that it's ruined every bit of eye you can't. That's the only thing I'm worried about. But it's great. It really is. What is the sensation most like? Roller coaster or...? Well, when I first took off, by God, I could hear bells in my ears, everything. But generally, flight attendants carried out their duties inside the cabin. Women were specifically chosen for hostessing duties because they imparted reassurance. As one writer noted during a particularly rough flight when he saw the stewardess reassuring a fellow passenger, the passengers relax. If a mere girl isn't worried, why should they be? And then there was the glamour factor. It's good to hear that British girls, so often compared unfavorably with their American sisters, are the tops with Pan American Airways. These are the first of 50 chosen as stewardesses for the American airline. Picked for their personality and charm, their reward will be world travel and a thousand pounds a year salary. Royal duty was particularly sought after. Introducing the crew of the BOAC Strutter Cruiser that is carrying the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh to the West Indies at the start of their Commonwealth tour. And looking after the comfort of the royal party is Miss Juanita Alice Palandi, the flight stewardess. In command is Captain A.C. Lorraine, a senior pilot with over 14,000 flying hours to his credit. We are greatly honoured to be so selected. We have considerable experience of the aircraft and of the route in question. In the years following the war, the Boeing 377 Stratocruiser provided high-flying luxury to its passengers. The convivial cocktail lounge served in-flight drinks and employed a dedicated bartender. It was a very pleasant way to while away the hours. The introduction of jet airliners and larger volumes of passengers saw seat-based service become the focus for cabin crew. Airlines competed to provide the best food and most attentive staff. But service with a smile wasn't the flight attendant's only job. Six thousand feet up above the Australian landscape, an eagle flew into one of the propellers of the airliner Bangana. Immediately the engine burst into flames and dropped off, and one wing began to crack up. But by a miracle of superb handling, the pilot brought his plane down in a field, and no one was hurt. Here the engine fell, half a mile from the spot where the airliner finally came to rest. There were eleven passengers. They had a rendezvous with death in the sky. They escaped without a scratch, and they're smiling now. But the one who showed them all how to act in the face of disaster was the air hostess, Atta Girl. From the beginning, airlines saw flight attendants as playing a key role in emergency situations. One early executive said he could see, quote, the value they would be to us, not only in the neater and nicer method of serving food and looking out for the passenger's welfare, but also in an emergency, unquote. And it turned out that emergencies weren't the only problems to be solved by flight and cabin crew. In 1954, a BOAC flight was leaving Australia with the wife of a Soviet defector on board. Evdokya Petrov was accompanied by KGB agents intent on returning her to Russia. Frightened by the screaming crowds that surrounded her at the airport, Mrs. Petrov famously lost a shoe in the melee 
and was hustled onto the BOAC constellation, unsure of her husband Mikhailovich Petrov's whereabouts. A Russian-speaking air hostess asked her if she had heard about her husband's public plea to join him in defecting to Australia. To escape her minder's clutches, Mrs. Petrov joined the stewardess in the lavatory, where she listened to a translation of the news report. When the aeroplane landed to refuel at Darwin, Mrs. Petrov was offered asylum, which she finally accepted after speaking by phone to her husband. The BOAC crew were feted as heroes when they arrived in Lebanon without Mrs. Petrov. In his debriefing, Petrov supplied valuable information to the West, although his revelation that Kim Philby was a Soviet agent was not accepted by the British at the time. The Petrovs lived the rest of their lives in suburban Melbourne under a variety of pseudonyms. However, while air hostesses were involved in many daring rescues and evacuations, their image was generally more sedate. This was due in part to the airline's habit of entering cabin crew into beauty contests at the drop of a hat. London Airport, home of trim craft with graceful lines, goes in for beauty of another kind as film star Valerie Hobson judges the Miss Airways of 1950 contest. Among the 15 air hostesses taking part, Australia and Miss Margaret Lamb of Qantas Airways, and from Air France, a continental beauty in Miss E. Oudinot wins fourth place. But Icelandic Airlines supplies the winner in 21-year-old hostess who received the blue ribbon of the air. Throughout the 1950s, flight attendants competed for the title of Miss Air Hostess or Miss Aviation. The winner brought glory to her airline and her country. In 1959, cabin crew from around the world gathered in Beirut to compete for the honor of being named Miss Aviation. The diversity of the contestants showed how quickly aviation was spreading around the world. Fourteen contestants paraded down the runway in front of a panel of judges that included Michel Tourma, Lebanon's tourist commissioner. The winner was 19-year-old Aida Kadi, a Middle East airline hostess in an attractive, short pink dress. Second was Jenny Wu from Singapore, employed by BOAC. Christa Heinzmann from Frankfurt, West Germany, came third. Kadi received 600 pounds and other gifts as her prize. In South Africa, Lena Pateron of Scandinavian Airways, Micheline Robesin from France and Ele Forseth from Pan American Airways were among the beauties competing in the Queen of the Air contest. The winner was Anne Price of Uxbridge, England, who won a £2,000 ring and was crowned by the Mayor of Johannesburg. And the British were again victorious in the Miss London Airport competition, which was held in the roof garden of the Queen's building at London Airport. The competition was fierce, with Miss Lufthansa, Gisela Wheeler of Bromley, Kent, a strong contender. But there could only be one winner, and it was declared to be BOAC stewardess Maureen Dale of Heston. Miss Alitalia came third, and Miss Pan America second. Who would be Miss London Airport? 22 of the charming girls who make our air trips worthwhile were in the final on the roof garden there. All work for the various airlines using London and Gatwick. They don't get their jobs entirely by looks, but appearance has a lot to do with it. Hence the high standard the competitors set. Gisela Wheeler, Miss Lufthansa. BOAC's choice, Maureen Dale of Heston. In the first stage of judging, six girls were selected. There's no big prize, just the honor of the thing, plus a night out being wined and dined in the West End. Maureen Dale won the title. Thanked by the second and third places, Miss London Airport 1961. Beauty, amiability and conformity were desirable traits in any 1950s woman, but particularly those who worked in the skies. When women got a job as a flight attendant, they were required to get a company-approved haircut and tutored in achieving the company-approved makeup look. The hostesses often have many duties on the tarmac, so a hood has been designed which, worn with their blue raincoats and boots, will protect them from bad weather.
But before the stewardess is equipped for a job which combines high-speed travel with ever-changing horizons, a course of training teaches her how to take care of her charges, the passengers. Good evening, madam. This is your seat on the left. Always the first consideration of the air hostess must be the passenger's comfort. While in the tiny kitchen, she prepares attractive meals to suit all flying conditions and climates. Another flying hazard to be negotiated is the serving of meals. But after training, she carries that through with a firm, confident step. Yet another item in her non-stop round of duties is the preparation of sleeping berths. Yes, British Overseas Airways are certainly flying high to give passengers jet-propelled speed and comfort all over the world. Flight attendants' uniforms became a matter of public debate. For British European Airways' 700 air girls, there's quite a battle on. All because BEA's chairman, Lord Douglas of Kirtleside, ordered the girls to shorten their skirts a couple of inches or so below the knee. It was Lady Douglas who put the idea in her husband's mind. For other hostesses on other airlines, the new length is nothing new. They've kept up as the fashion changed, and very nice too. If the hostess don't all like short skirts, what about other girls? Well, these usherettes are with them. They prefer the old length. Perhaps the nurses might like a change, even if it did send temperatures sorry. One thing's certain, though, bus conductresses don't want skirts at all in the winter, long or short. To many of the BEA girls, it's all a matter of principle. They think they should say whether those inches should stay on or come off. Well, what do you think? This pretty French hostess has a uniform designed in Paris, and she thinks it's the world's smartest. It's not extreme, it's in between. But Paris's extreme for 1958 took skirts right up to the knee. Now, nobody wants them too short. Or do they? The worldwide scope of aviation opened up opportunities for women in many countries. BOAC encouraged Chinese-speaking women to apply for positions in its Asian fleet. Here in the Meath, we're wearing the Chinese dress, the Chung Sang, which is as a uniform. And do you like the new uniform? Yes, and I'm very happy to model the first BOAC Chung Sang uniform. But again, clothes were the issue of the day for reporters, with this interviewer fascinated by the exotic silk Chung Sang worn by the women. Now, of course, you have the, the slits at the side of the skirt as well, and we think that is very daring here. Yeah. I think it's equally as daring to see European ladies with open neck lines. You think that's daring as well, the open neck lines. Well, I must say the slits are very attractive. Thank you. Like when the Chong Sam uniform went into service, it actually drew criticism from other flight attendants who condemned it for unfair competition, drawing attention away from the conventionally clad cabin crew. Japanese women were also recruited as BOAC flight attendants. However, their kimonos were a little more restrictive than the Chongsam and would have been highly impractical in an emergency evacuation. The women were selected from several hundred applicants to fly on the BOAC Hong Kong to Tokyo Comet and Tokyo to San Francisco Britannia flights. Trained by Chief Cabin Services Instructor John Lawrence, the stewardesses did their classes in a mock-up aircraft, learning everything from cocktail mixing to immigration regulations. At the end of the course, the women discarded their silk kimonos for the BOAC regulation blue uniform. However, some airlines embraced traditional dress, with Air India incorporating the sari into its stewardess uniform. They say the sari is the loveliest dress ever invented. And here, saris have become official uniforms. Here's a girl preparing to do an important, and some would say an exciting job. This is the latest design adopted by Air India for their stewardesses that fly around the world. Jet travel has brought East and West close together, and now the harassed passenger crossing the Atlantic has the beauty of the Orient at his elbow, giving him the comforts the air travelers expect. All the airlines pick beautiful women to be their stewardesses, 
but then they dress them up in tunics and sober skirts. Now feminine frills and gossamer glamour have taken to the air, bringing a touch of colour to the tarmac at London Airport when these shimmering shepherdesses bring their charges to the airport bus. And if you get the namaste greeting, the traditional Hindu way of saying happy landings, you'll be one of those contented people who know that they haven't missed the bus. Our girls in their fetching oriental uniforms drive off with a coachload of passengers. Hello. Good afternoon. Good Welcome afternoon. aboard. Thanks very much. You're welcome. For the American businessman, the airline's most frequent flyer, the flight attendant was the calming influence who took his bag and coat and brought him a drink when he wanted one. She was there to cater to every need with a smile for every situation, no matter how demanding the passenger or how difficult the problem. Passengers board the plane only a few minutes before takeoff, but long before this, preparations for the flight are begun. <laughs> of course, some problems are bigger than others. Would you send up the seatbelt extension right away, please? Thank you. No smoking, and please fasten your seatbelt. Oh, thank you. You're huh? welcome. Oh, that's handy. Now we can take off. Yeah, you're all set. <laughs> As a passenger, it's just a matter of boarding the plane and enjoying the trip. The image of the stewardess as glamorous Hi. waitress and the job, the title of Trolley Dolly. And Despite the air hostess's important tonight. safety role, well, it was an image you, the airlines did little to dispel, and, this plane and several be played up to it, well, outfitting stewardesses yet. in fashionable but impractical clothing. Wouldn't be the first time. Bye now. Bye. Thanks for a great trip. You're welcome, sir. Bye-bye. Goodbye now. The life of an air hostess was seen as exciting, adventurous, and hectic. So the Coca-Cola company decided to enlist an air hostess to spruik its product, associating it with high-flying travel and boundless energy. Mary Ann Lynch took off at 7.45 a.m., flew 2,949 miles, made three stops, and most of the trip still lies ahead. Now there are schedules to check, flight reports to make, a quick supper with friends before turning in. Next morning, on the go again at 6.15, then St. Louis, Cincinnati, finally New York. Glamour job. Mary Ann has made dozens of runs like this, served hundreds of hot meals, greeted thousands of new people. It all demands a lot of charm and works out to a lot of Coke. Does Coca-Cola have the taste you never get tired of? Do we mean it when we say Coke is always refreshing? Is things go better with Coke after Coke after Coke? Just a slogan? Write Miss Mary Ann Lynch, Trans World Airlines, Box 7144, St. Louis, Missouri. She'll tell you. Not surprisingly, there was great competition for stewardess jobs. She wants to be an air hostess, and ANSET a and is looking for 80 more girls just like her. It's a major recruiting campaign, and all the girls are needed by Christmas because of an unprecedented increase in passenger traffic. Training is thorough. Everything from geography, so they know where they're flying, to first aid and meal service. The airline has 240 hostesses, but their average stay with the company is only about two years. By then, most of them are married or are traveling overseas. The girls must be proficient in first aid before they're accepted. And during training, they learn all aircraft procedures, including emergency drills, just in case. The new recruiting campaign includes girls needed for the airline's new Boeing 727 Pure Jets, so these prospective hostesses get an introduction in a dummy cockpit. With more passengers, more planes and more marriages, 80 girls must complete their training by Christmas. Air hostesses of the near future, girls who really aim high when it comes to choosing a career. As times became more enlightened, the role of the flight attendant became more focused on safety and doors opened to allow a broader cross-section of society to work in the air. In 2007, Britain's Patricia Fitzgerald became the first person to use new anti-age discrimination laws to land herself her dream job on board a British Airways aircraft. I saw an advertisement in the BA News and it said about cabin crew, and I thought, wow because I've come to that stage in my life now where I can actually afford to do what I want to do. 
And I said to my partner, oh, look at this, thinking he'd say, oh, you know, don't be so silly. And he said, well, yeah, go for it. And then with that sort of in mind, I applied, um, had the interview, got the job. We don't deliberately recruit by age. It's about ability and motivation to do this role. But having that wide range of people, I think, for a diverse passenger that we, that we move around the world, I think it, it, it's, it's good news for them. And it's good news for Patricia Fitzgerald, who had spent nearly 40 years working for BOAC, later British Airways, but on the ground in a clerical position. She's now where she always dreamed she'd be, in the sky. And how important personally has it been for you? Hugely. It's been so empowering because um, it's so easy to get into a rut, you know, and to go and do something, to challenge yourself. Um, it, it's, oh, it's just, I would recommend it to anybody. As 58-year-old Patricia Fitzgerald breaks new ground for cabin crew and aviation approaches the second decade of the 21st century, it's anyone's guess where aviation will be at the end of the next decade. Will flight attendants be working in zero gravity, ministering to space tourists? Well, there will be at least one flight attendant in space soon, with the news that French air hostess Mathilde Pont has won a flight on the rocket plane XL through a competition on a chocolate bar. The 32-year-old is due to blast off for her 60-mile-high journey to the edge of space within two years.